Yes, it's John G. Sutton, Tales from the Jails. Let's talk a little bit today about haunted prisons. I mean, if you believe in ghosts, do you believe in ghosts? Well, I believe that there are spirits, discarnate entities, that do uh, enter this material realm where they have some perhaps uh, eternal ties and certainly if anywhere is going to be haunted then surely you would say it would be some of the disgraceful dungeons that we today call prisons places of execution places of torture, despair and anguish where prisoners over the centuries in which these buildings have stood, these prisons, these grim walls and within the inmates walked and now very often their spirits still haunt. I'll tell you a little this is truth and it's my truth. Occasionally I suffer from what I call, uh, it's like a, a, a stress disorder, you know? A post-traumatic stress disorder from when I was at the strange ways and um, I have a recurring nightmare in which I am walking the landings can't find my keys. For some reason, I find my hat. My hat's on my head. In my pocket is my truncheon. I've got boots on my feet. And I'm walking endlessly. Alone. All the cells are closed. All the doors are closed. I cannot find my keys. I cannot find the exit. Night after night, this recurring nightmare occurs to me. And then it'll go and I won't see the nightmare. I won't experience that. And I wake up in the middle of the night quite disturbed by this, determined not to walk those within those walls again. And I go back to sleep. And sure enough, there I am on the landings. Usually I see myself on the threes, going up to the fours, walking around, that's the, that's the landing, you see. But there is no exit, and there are no keys. That's my nightmare. And that's strange ways. Uh, there are parts that are exceedingly haunted. I wing. Yeah, I, I3, I believe it is. That's in the, the top part of the prison, not in the main bulk of the prison, the top part of the prison. that used to be the Borstal Allocation Centre and the YP wings. Yeah, there, on I3. That, that's where the ghost of Mrs. Merriweather walks. I was there one, one day at working in the clinic on I1 landing and I heard this terrible banging coming up from the threes on. I went up to the to the cell door and said what's the matter boy but as I was getting there I could see a black like a, a shadow you know moving across the landing it was a, quite a dumpy shadow you know but it was a shadow and I thought that's a bit strange this you know and, it, and it, as it passed it, it was a shadow and I thought well, how can this be you know I didn't really at that instant didn't recognize it as the, a discarnate spirit although it was cold so I opened the door, I said to the to the young man inside who was screaming and banging on the walls, I said, hey, calm down. He said, there's a woman been in my cell. I said, there's no woman been in your cell, young man. There's only me and thee. And there'll only be thee when I get me boots on. That's an old joke, by the way. No, but seriously, I did say there's only me and you on this particular part of the prison at the moment. And I'm down on I one and I hear you banging. What is it? He said, a woman been in my cell and described this woman. He said, she's only about five foot, about five foot, but wearing a black 
uh, outfit black. She's black, but she's white and she's dumpy. And I said, this is no, there's no women in here. You know, this is uh, a male prison, you know, and you'd be all right, you know, calm down, you know. So I, I persuaded him that he was okay and he sat on his bed and I didn't give him a cuddle or anything like that, but I did get him some calm, calming words and left him to it, you know. But I made a note in the incident book and uh, when all the rest of the staff came back, because it was lunchtime, you see, when all the rest of the staff came back, I mentioned it to the principal officer on the way. Oh, he said, that's Mrs. Merriweather. She said, she's just often seen on there. So that was the cell that she was held in immediately before she was taken down to uh, the main part of the prison to the execution shed. Mrs. Merriweather had poisoned uh, a lady that she was paid to uh, care for. She'd put some poison into her marmalade or jam and uh, killed the old lady so that she could uh, overtake her, her property. And uh, of course she'd been discovered and was sentenced to hang and she was hung at Strangeways Jail in the 1950s. Mrs. Merriweather. Seriously. That particular inmate had seen her ghost. And I'd seen the shape. She wasn't. It wasn't distinct to me. It was a dark shape, like a, f a shadow floating by. But it was definitely cold. There are haunted areas in, in many old, old prisons. I'll tell you a little story. This is the truth, yeah? At Strange Ways, uh, the, the people were seeing the ghost of James Ellis, the hangman. I've previously discussed this, so you can look it up here. All my things are numbered, you know? And I believe it's called the ghost of the Strange Ways hangman. Yeah, well, he was frequently seen on B1 landing, but uh, on, on E1 landing, they had... Uh, uh, a sighting on E1 landing. Nobody was sure what it was. Just a shadow move. They're quite they move as shadows, you know, very often. Yeah. Uh, so one night, yeah, when when it was people on night, uh, and the, and the guy was supposed to be patrolling E wing. A couple of us went down and hid on E1 landing, and as he came walking down E1 landing, we 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 kind of jumped out and pretended to be ghosts. <laughs> It was just a joke, you know. He could run pretty fast, that lad, you know. He was a big fella, but managed to get a fair pace on when we, we started going, the, it's that kind of nonsense, you know. Uh, it was only a joke. Mm -hmm. the, same, the same guy, he was a former heavyweight boxing champion, you know, and uh, he was on nights. He was, a, and he was an auxiliary officer, actually. He was a night patrol auxiliary officer on nights at Strange Ways. A big fella, about six foot four. Had fought for the heavyweight championship of, of Great Britain against, I think it was Jack London, Brian London's father, you know. You know, Brian London who fought Muhammad Ali. Yeah, well, Jack London was his father and this guy had boxed him. I think it was at Bellevue or somewhere. And he was working as an auxiliary night patrol officer at Strange Ways. And I don't know what made me do it, but he hung his jacket up behind the door because it was quite a warm night, you know. And he went on the patrol. And whilst he was out doing the patrols, I got a needle and thread and sewed his, the sleeves of his jacket up just for a joke. So when it came uh, in the morning and it was time for us to get our kit on and get ready to go off duty, he lifted his jacket off the back and put his arms in, and of course, he couldn't get his hands through the end of his sleeves because I'd sewn them up, you know. And uh, he, he ripped the jacket off, threw it on the thing, and there was another officer in there, and he said, Right, you, you bastard, you've done this to my jacket. And he grabbed hold of him, he was a big fella, you know, and he was he was bloody angry. And he grabbed all this fella and started to swing. I said, whoa, I said, don't do this. I said, listen, it was me that did that. I did it. I said, I only did it for a joke. I said, I'm very sorry if it's offended you, you know, but it was only meant as a joke. No, John, he said, you wouldn't do a thing like that. You're a gentleman. And he, and he got this fella by <coughs> Bash! 
bash, but four times he bashed him in the head. I thought, hell, it really was me that did it, but I was rather pleased that I didn't get the bashes in the head. Hmm. It wasn't a ghost, that. That was me being a silly bastard. Anyway, uh, I'm going to do it now. Yeah, This isn't uh, a song. I'm not going to give you a song today. I killed one yesterday, didn't I? I murdered that. Yeah, the, the Highwayman. Did you listen to that? Yeah. That one won't return. Yeah, here we go. There we are. I'll ring the song, Dinger. It's not a song. It's a couple of poems, actually. But the supernatural. I'm going to first of all recite you a poem that I wrote myself. This is my poem. I wrote this for uh, my friend. Uh, his father died. He was very much a family man. He's my friend's father. Really nice guy. Been married about 45 years. Uh, and he was hit. So a car hit him crossing on a crossing, zebra crossing. There's some woman, a lady driver accidentally I assume hit him because she wasn't watching where she was going and it took him about two years to die and he definitely didn't want to die he loved his family and loved his wife and he'd been a good honest working man all his life and, and to when he gets to when he's been about 60 he was hit on, on, on the uh, zebra crossing near his house and uh, it took him about two years to die, but eventually he did. So when, on his death, I wrote this poem for him. Uh, it's how he would have felt, I thought, how he would have felt in the spirit world on the on the first week that he was out, out of his body because he passed into the spirit. And this is the poem I wrote for him. It, it's called I Was Gone. And his name was Albert Greenall. Yeah. And he lived in the town of Lee. And uh, his son, Ken, my mate, it's his birthday this coming Saturday. Sent him a DVD for his birthday. I still see him now and again. Anyway, this is a poem that I wrote. It's called I Was Gone. I was gone this morning when I looked in the mirror to comb my hair. In the living room, I searched. There was no one in my chair. I was gone this afternoon, as you went to dry your tears, it's so hard to see you crying for those long ago years. I was gone this evening as you went to climb the stair. Then you turned but didn't see me, my footsteps trod the air. I was gone in the moonlight as the silent silver shone. Then I heard you whisper my name, but I was gone. There you are. I was gone by John G. Sutton. And that's in my book called Flowers and Collected Poems, which is available on Amazon, by the way. And this is a poem for a guy called Michael Feeney, who sometimes sends me little love letters. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, this is a song because Michael's in Ireland. Uh, and I do like Ireland. Been there many times. Uh, this is uh, by Seamus Heaney, And it's a poem called Digging. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests snug as a gun. Under my window... A clean rasping sound when the spade sinks in to gravelly ground. My father digging, I loop down till his straining hump among the flower beds bends low, comes up twenty years away, stooping in rhythm through potato drills where he was digging. The coarse boot nestled on the lug. The shaft against the inside knee was levelled firmly. He rooted out tall tops, buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness in our hands. By God, the old man could handle a spade just like his old man. 
My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Toner's bog. Once I carried him milk in a bottle, cut sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to right away, nicking and slicing, neatly heaving sods over his shoulder going down and down for the good turf digging. The cold smell of potato mould, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of an edge through living roots awaken in my head. But I've no spade to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. Seamus Heaney. Tales from the Jails. Hope you've enjoyed. Do like and subscribe, maybe. Thank you very much. We'll meet again.